Welcome to episode 387 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer and producer Richard Finney. He's one of our industry judges for our contest and also a writer and producer. He's written and produced a number of films. He comes on today to talk about his career and offers up some great insight into the writing process. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episodes number 387. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. And again, it's completely free. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. A quick few words about what I'm working on. So we're still meeting with distributors on the Rideshare Killer. It hasn't been hard to get meetings with distributors, but they all sound very similar and not a single one has really instilled much confidence in this that they can actually sell the film. But I think we're gonna be making a decision here in the next week or two. So hopefully I'll have some news on that shortly. The other big thing I've been working on and talking about a lot on this podcast is the course that we're getting ready to launch. SYS is from concept to completion screenwriting course. It will take you through every part of writing a screenplay, coming up with a concept, outlining it, writing the opening pages, the first act, second act, third act, and then rewriting. And then there's even a module at the end on marketing your screenplay once it's polished and ready to be sent out. We're offering the course in two versions. For $200, you get the course, but you also get three analyses from an SYS reader. You'll get one analysis on your outline, and then you'll get two on your final draft of your screenplay. This is just our introductory price. You're getting three full analyses, which is actually the same price as our three-pack analysis bundle. So you're essentially getting the course for free when you pay for the three analyses that come with it. And to be clear, you're getting a full analysis with this package. It's the same analysis that you would get if you bought the SYS script analysis package. The other version is just $50 and you get you just get the course. And then you'll have to find some friends or colleagues who will do, do the feedback portion of the course with you. In fact, right now I'm actually letting SYS Select members do this version of the course at no extra charge. So if you're a member of SYS Select, you actually already have access to this. Hopefully you saw my email. I sent out an email a couple weeks to the SYS Select members to kind of do an early launch with them. So if you're a member of SYS Select, no need to purchase this. And in fact, that might be one way you could get this if you want to try out SYS Select and this course you get right now, you get the course with SYS Select. A big piece of this course is account accountability. Once you start the course, you'll get an email every Sunday with that week's assignment. And if you don't complete it, we'll follow up with another email reminder the following week. It's easy to pause the course if you need to take some time off. But as long as you're enrolled and you're, you're continuing with the course, you'll get these reminders and it's going to hopefully walk you through this process until each step is completed. The objective of this course is to get you through it in six months so that you have a completed polished screenplay ready to be sent out. If this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It's all one word, all lowercase. I will, of course, link to this in the show notes, and I will put in a link to the homepage as well. So that's the main things that I've been working on here the last couple of weeks. Now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer and producer Richard Finney. Here is the interview. Welcome, Richard, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Hey, Ashley, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? I actually grew up in uh, Simi Valley. So, um, you know, <laughs> a rock throw away from where Charles Manson was. And everything. Yeah, exactly. During that time, actually, that's where he was. Huh. And, um, and 
my I, I guess my my thing would be is I probably got into the business because my father actually started in the business. Uh, he was working at Television City and CBS in Hollywood where they were shooting, uh, you know, the time he was an executive there, they were shooting all in the family and Maude and good times. And, um, and, and I think that that was, you know, I've always wanted to be a screenwriter, but I think that that was like one of the things that really started it all for, for a couple of reasons. I think for, we would get like Christmas gifts from Carol Burnett, you know, and, hmm. and, uh, and I would go there and I would see the, the shows being re recorded and, and taped and, and videotaped and, and, uh, and I, it demystified everything for me. So I thought that that was a, a key thing. And then I think the other key thing was had helped me get involved in wanting to do this too was uh, my father would bring home uh, the, the scripts of the programs that they were going to shoot and um, or they were going to air like you know in a couple weeks and I'm talking all the family mod you know good times and I would read them and you know they were good but they weren't really funny I didn't see them as funny hmm. and then. I would either go and see the show being recorded or I would see it on, 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 on air, just like everybody else. And they were hilarious and they were fantastic. Hmm. And, uh, and so suddenly, you know, the profound thing I learned was that, you know, how much actors bring to it. And I guess the bigger lesson, too, is that, you know, that this is where I began was that if you were going to get involved in screenwriting, you know, you were playing a team sport. It wasn't going to be necessarily, you know, an author writing a book, you know, so um, which I've now done. But at the same time, I was just simply interested in doing the screenwriting part because I could definitely see myself being a team player and writing stuff that would excite somebody enough that they would bring something to the table and you would go, oh, my, man, that's that's amazing costume design or that's mm -hmm. amazing the way you read that. or it, So that's what screenwriting for me is all about. And that's what I took from it. And, and when did you start? OK, so you're growing up, you're reading these scripts and you're kind of seeing the industry. When did you actually take that first step? OK, I'm going to start writing some scripts. And then once you've written some scripts, actually giving them to your dad or your dad's friends. What was that evolution like? When did you start actually writing and then start sending them to people? So, you know, I so always wanting to be a screenwriter was was a blessing because I just always had that direction. So uh, I went to Cal State Northridge and, uh, you know, went through their film and television program. And while I was doing that, I was always writing, you know, screenplays. And uh, and then when I graduated, I had written uh, and rewritten and rewritten and written. Uh, you know, a, a, the story I would say is, is that um, at one point. There was an opportunity for a producer uh, to read my script through somebody else. And I sat there and I go, oh, you know, here, here, take a look at this script. And um, and so like it was, it was like almost two years out of school. I had this one producer who had a, a very good track record and, of making indie films and, and stuff. Uh, and he was definitely old school. But he optioned he optioned my script, and hmm. so my very first script that I wrote and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote, but it did get optioned, and I worked with uh, him, and it was it was it was trial by fire. I mean, he would literally read the lines out loud and like make fun of them, and you would sit there and you would start to realize, you know, very early on, you know, well, okay, well, I'm not we're never gonna make that mistake again, or I'm not gonna sound like that, or I'm not gonna do that. So I learned, you know, he, mm -hmm. he was he was a jerk, he was an asshole, and everything, but he was a good guy as far as like learning, teaching me about mm -hmm. what was like wrong with this stuff. Then I think that the next big break for me was... How did you meet that guy? Just so I can cut you off. How did you meet that first guy and get that script option? So I, I think, you know, last week I was listening to the, the, the gentleman that you had talking to. And, and he said something about like, you know, um, like when you're first starting out, if you could just stay very close to the, the, the industry the, you know, on a regular job, that's like the best, you know, because... You just never know, right? You're just like maybe one removed, right? And so that was like, that's what I was kind of thinking, like, uh, because I did not draw on my father's things, not that, because he, he was more on the technical side anyway, so it wasn't like I was going to be, be able to draw on him. But but anyway, uh, so I started writing for Fangoria magazine, and so there suddenly I was on uh, a, a, like a movie set, 
And I ended up like uh, these guys that, uh, you know, Darren Scott and uh, people like that, they were doing the sequel to uh, Stepfather. So they were doing Stepfather 2. That was the very first article I wrote for Fangoria. Those guys ended up being lifelong friends, still friends. Mm -hmm. And but they were the ones that actually sat there at, after the article was written and everything. You know, I, I think they were the ones that uh, said, hey, you know, there's this one producer guy, you know, you should you should give him that one script you were talking about. And I said, oh, OK. And so they were probably the ones that actually hooked it up. I'm kind of vague about how it yeah. actually happened and everything. But that then what happened after that, after the guy uh, optioned it was, um, you know, then getting the agent was easy because then I was like, you know, oh, you should go to so and so. You should go to so and so. And so I went to this one. Um, Irene Robinson was my very first agent. And um, my quick little story is that the, when I was sitting down meeting her, she actually then said, oh, uh, here, there's my husband. He's 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 come to pick me up. And uh, and I turned around and there was uh, uh, Andrew Robinson, the psycho and Dirty Harry. And I was like, oh, my God, that's your husband. And she's like, yeah, yeah. You see the movie? Oh, yeah, of course. I see the movie. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, huh. um, so she was my first agent and she was great. Uh, and she she loved me because I was able to get my first script option, my second uh, script option, and my third script option, you know, very, very quickly and uh, started, you know, working with people to, you know, get them made. Um, mm -hmm. But at, during that time, um, they still weren't getting made and I wasn't making a lot of money. So I was still working some other jobs. So I would say the next big thing was I was working at, at a television station in Oxnard. And we were, um, I was assigned to produce uh, a, a, a film festival, the Santa Barbara Film Festival, the television version of it, like an hour and a half, uh, 90 minute thing. So I, one of the things that I did as a producer was uh, I, cho I was, I had to do a segment where I interviewed for the, the screenwriting work uh, panel. So I interviewed all the different screenwriters and then put together, uh, you know, about, about a nine minute package that was going to be running in, into the overall show. And during that, uh, I met Dan Petrie Jr. and interviewed him. And uh, and, you know, so you have to prepare for these things. And but, you know, I, obviously I would say I was prepared for the, you know, in my entire life because I love movies. But he had done Beverly Hills Cop at that point and Big Easy, and he was uh, about to do Turner and, Sho uh, Turner and Hooch, and he was uh, there promoting, uh, but talking in this panel, uh, Shoot to Kill movie. So anyway, I interviewed him, and, and it went great, and then afterwards he was like, hey, dude, you, you, you know, you those were great questions and you know a lot, you know, what, what you, you want to be in the business, right? And I was like, yeah, I want to be a screenwriter. And so he read a script and he loved it and it was great. And, and so he said, so then after that, he said, Hey, listen, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a deal at Disney and they are, uh, uh, thinking about, they're going to do this thing called Robert Highlands, the puppet masters. And, uh, I think we should put you up for it. And I would be producing and possibly directing, but uh, they have a, a script. It's it's terrible, and uh, they want another writer. But they're probably still going to hang on to these other writers. So you want to go for it? And I said, Yeah, absolutely. So the the point of the story is that uh, I went in there, and after reading the script, and and it was bad, and just saying, you know, this is the 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 thing that was you know wrong with the script. And here's how I would fix it. And I mean, you know, I spoke for 20, 30 minutes and then said, you know, let me just say, you, you, whatever you do, that's, of course, up to you guys. But if you please, there's so many I heard you use the word trope. There's so many tropes, uh, you know, in this thing. You, you don't want to if you don't hire me, just hire somebody, please, like me, that knows everything that's wrong with this thing. So um, so here's the point of the story, <laughs> even though I've been going on and on. It's the point of the story being that, so the meeting went well. So they tell Dan, they say, hey, we like him. We love him. So let's look at, at Ryan Sample. So they looked at my Ryan Sample that Dan had read. And they really liked it, called on Monday and said, we really like this. Can we see one more thing? And so uh, I gave him one more thing. And then next week they called back on Monday and said, we really like this. This is really good. This guy's really good. Can we make sure though? Can we read one more thing? And so 
you know, we gave him one more thing, and the next Monday I, I got the job. The thing about it is to, to say to you, because, uh, you know, uh, I, I know a lot of people ask these questions and everything, but basically I only got that job because I had three samples, you know, not just three writing samples, but three samples that I felt really good about, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, were good, you know. And, and so the thing about it is you got to work. You got to you got to write all the time, because when even when you do get that opportunity, you can't just be like handing over one script. And, and you know, then nobody's going to hire you to write something else based on just one script. So that's that's the lesson I think very early on. And so mm -hmm. that started my screenwriting career. And, and even though I didn't get credit on the Robert Highlands, the Puppet Masters, it was a great process to go through. And uh, there are things in there that, you know, we, we definitely worked on. And um, and that was my first studio job. Gotcha, gotcha. So then at this point, though, were you writing in horror? Were these three samples? You mentioned you had three scripts with your agent. Were these three samples all horror like this potential puppet master script that they were going to hire you for? It's That's a great question. Um, you know what? They probably actually, I think two were horror and one was more of uh, science fiction. So um, and and that's the thing, you know, I, I, I the the thing was that I, I knew that. And I think that's why Dan said, hey, let's go for this is because he knew that I, I knew this arena really, really well. And frankly, the one of the things, too, was that the my agent and, and eventually I uh, I was with Irene for a while. Then I got another agent and that other agent was, I think, pretty smart about just simply saying, hey, look, I, I think you're capable of writing other stuff. But um, but right now, let's just kind of ID you as, you know, identify you as to the industry as, you know, somebody that's going to be writing and, and not necessarily horror. It was going to be kind of like science fiction ish kind of stuff. And I think that was the right move. That was a smart move, because then from there, I, I think that so my big trajectory after getting there and doing this was uh, there was two things that happened again with Dan. I was still having to work at Fox Television as a videotape editor uh, because I had a family to support. And um, and I was like, you know, working there and it was I always considered it the second best job in the world because it was a really you were editing for the news and I was also producing mm -hmm. segments and it was great. But it was the second best job because I wanted to be a screenwriter. I wanted to be a filmmaker. But uh, then one day uh, Dan called up and he said, uh, uh, listen, um, I've gotten this assignment and I've fallen behind and I'd love to you come in and like come in and, and, and write it with me. And I said, oh, that's that's great. You know, we can work on weekends. This is the time that I have off. And he's like, oh, no, you don't understand. You know, um, I, I, you got to You got to leave your job and 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 come come over and do this, because if, if they like it, if we, what we do a good job, then we're going to do a production rewrite and then maybe even something more, you know, during the during the line. So I was like, oh, man, I can't do that. And, you know, so. We literally went through, well, how much do you make? You know, so, and then then he basically said, look, uh, uh, we'll pay you. I'll pay you. Uh, the studio will pay you um, this amount of money for uh, one month's work. And that is what you would make in three years being there. Hmm. So I said, and I quit that night. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was what started. And that ended up being a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie for Sony and a maximum risk. And again, did not get credit. But at the same time, you know, we did uh, the script was uh, they were going to not do it or do it. And our script got them to do it. Then we did a production rewrite and we did a polish. And the reality is, is that the the first writer got credit. But everything that is pretty much that film is like, you know, that's what we did. So mm -hmm. now I was working at the studio system. And uh, and then the next big thing happened. Then I started like uh, going to different places and pitching uh, uh, my projects. So I would I because I had some really cool ideas, I thought. And uh, and when I would tell my agent about these ideas, they you know, he would go crazy and he would say, oh, you know, you got to go out with this, this stuff. So the big one. So I, what ended up happening was I ended up selling uh, three pitches. Uh, within a six-month period at the studios for a lot of money, each one. 
But the one that actually was really the big breakthrough was uh, I had uh, set it up with uh, Steven Spielberg. So that story, uh, if you don't mind me telling No, no, yeah, this is fascinating. Yeah, let's yeah, hear it. Yeah, right. So that story was pretty funny because what we did, and this sort of gives you a glimpse of what used to be, what the industry used to be like, because it's, I don't know, I don't think it is very much like this anymore, but at the time, the goal was, I had hooked, the, the agent hooked me up with this one producer who's great, uh, Robert Lawrence, and we sat there and the, the game plan was, you go out in two days and you sit there and you hit all the different studios, and you sit there and you, you just, you, you do a pitch, and you hope that one, you know, that would be great, but two or three, go for it, and then you get into some kind of bidding war, right? So on the very first day we went out, um, you know, at the end of the day, we uh, already knew that uh, that Disney was making, had made an offer. They were making an offer, and that, but we had pitched it also to uh, DreamWorks, which they were at that time a, a new company, Mm -hmm. And um, and we pitched to an executive, Jason Hoffs, and he he loved it and and he uh, wanted uh, Spielberg to hear it. And so he briefly told Spielberg about it. And then he got back to us, our agent, and said, you know, uh, Stephen wants to hear this tomorrow morning. So we so we said, oh, wow. OK, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And when we heard this news, we had just walked out of our very last pitch meeting that day. And we heard that Disney was made had already made an offer. And now Spielberg was wanting to hear this, but all I heard about, all I heard was Spielberg, we're going to be pitching to Spielberg. And I mean, I was just so petrified and everything because I was the one that was doing the pitching. You know, Robert was there and he would do the setup and, and then I was doing the pitching. And suddenly I'm like, what, I'm going to be pitching Spielberg. I, I was just like, I was totally, I was like, and Robert saw that and he, so they, we made the plan. Let's not close the deal with Disney. Let's at least pitch to Spielberg. And then he said, Richard, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll pitch it to Spielberg. All right. And I was like, oh, thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So I went to sleep knowing, hey, look, you know, worst case scenario, Disney. You know, was, we got this thing sold. And then, you know, Spielberg, but, you know, off the pitch. So we're walking up to see where we're at. We're going to his house. But then we're walking up to, to, into the area to, to, to do the pitch. And at, at that point, that's when Robert turns to me and says, hey, so by the way, Richard, you are going to pitch this. And I said, what? What are you talking about? And he said, I just told you that to so get a good night's sleep. Richard, you've got to pitch this. Come on now. And so <laughs> I, I pitched it. And, uh, and I would just say to you, there have been times when I've been performing or, or just pitching and you know, everything like that. And like when you're pitching, you're supposed to re read the room. You're supposed to actually see people and, and see their reactions so that you can change things. You can meet, speed things up, lose things if you don't see the reaction because you always want them to be thinking so what happens next what happens next what happens? and so you read the room while in this case i did what i would do sometimes is just blur out the audience so i started up and spielberg's there and i was he was just a blur and mm -hmm. then i finished and then he just said i love this i want to do this and so, uh, so we ended up uh, going with uh, DreamWorks and Spielberg, and it was it had made a big splash. And so suddenly, you know, I was not everything else was great, but mm -hmm. now all of a sudden I'm like working with Spielberg in studios. I had also sold a pitch to Mel Gibson's company. Uh, they they were very hot at the time too. But they're still whatever. And um, and so I was all of a sudden that was my whole career got started. Really? Yeah, yeah. So how did this end up with Spielberg? I think you mentioned that it got um, eventually turned into a video game or something. Uh, well, you know what it did? It was like it was really weird thing because it, 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 you know, first of all, it was great. We were able to like work and develop the thing and everything. I would just say in one sentence, all of a sudden, you, you know, you get something and it's fantastic. But then you get this thing where every every direction that we would go creatively was like, oh, we can't do that. He's Steven's already done that. You know, he's already mm -hmm. done that. He's already done that. You know, it's Alien Zoo. So, we, you know, he's been there on the alien thing. So we were definitely, you know, uh, you know, really trying to be innovative and, and original. But then you had that extra burden of not doing something that Spielberg had done. So it was tough. Right. Yeah. So anyway, it wound up. I would just definitely say in development hell. 
Um, but it was never dead. And to illustrate that, it was never dead. At some point, it, it, I think it wound up at DreamWorks uh, Animation. So now they were thinking about doing it as an animation project. So I was there for, for some of that. Then at some point, it just kind of like... It, 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 and then, so now we're jumping forward to like 2018, 2019. And now it is this big thing that is, uh, it's this VR uh, attraction that opened up in Century City in 2019, 2020. Mm. They had expanded to, uh, I think, four uh, different locations. Um, uh, and then the pandemic stopped everything. But so something that I had set up as a, you know, created and then, and then worked with them and just never got made as a movie Spielberg, uh, in interviews with him and Walter Parks, they talk about where, where, where did this idea for this VR attraction come from? And, and they definitely admit, oh, it was this project that we had at a movie studio that we didn't get made into a movie, but we thought this would be really great. So they're, they're going to keep on expanding. And so this is something that, um, frankly, uh, you know, wasn't even in my contract originally. VR, nobody yeah. even knew about this kind of stuff. So that's that's how crazy the whole business can be. Is like you're working on something that it finally does see the light of day, but it's in a kind of a form that, of course, I, I had no idea at that time when I, when mm -hmm. I you know created it. But yeah, that's yeah. where. And if the funny. VR attraction takes off, no doubt that might actually put a little you know heat behind the script at some point. You know these absolutely. things. Absolutely. Can... Yeah, absolutely. That's the way things work. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it sounds like you were producing these segments up in Oxnard, sort of news segments. But at what point did you start to segue into producing as a screenwriter producer? So, um, yeah, the, the the thing about it was I was so I was working a lot, but I I call I, at that at that point, you know, I'm, I'm working on Alien Zoo, I'm working with on a project with uh, you know Mel Gibson's company, I'm working on these different projects, but I I considered it eventually I considered it a velvet coffin. Because, you know, uh, nothing was getting made. And so it was very frustrating for me. And, and, I, and again, it's like one of those, yeah, good problems, right? So, I mean, I don't want to, like, oh, feel sorry for him. But, but yeah, that was yeah. really how I felt. I really wanted to make movies. I didn't want to just keep on writing screenplays. And frankly, you know, writing screenplays, you, you, you want to collaborate, first of all. But you also want people to see the stories. So that wasn't happening. So basically what I did was I made a conscious effort. I sat there and there was a guy, uh, his name is Terry Michael. And, and a lot of times we'd run into each other. He was a straight ahead independent producer and he would be at these production companies or at these studios in the lobby area waiting for his meeting and as I was going to meet him. And so, so we got talking and everything. And pretty soon what basically happened, I made a conscious effort to say, I, I want to produce some stuff that, that at first I said, that has nothing to do with my screenwriting. And, and I felt that that was the smart way to go because then then I would learn the, the whole producing thing. But uh, and the best thing is that not to have one of your, your own ch children like, you know, mm. be. So I went into it. And you know what? I, I again, was very, very fortunate. We, we we found some really good stuff, some good material. And in like uh, about a two and a half year period, three year period, we made five films. And one of the films was um, our first film that we did together was 100 Girls, and um, and and uh, that was like when we were talking earlier, you and I. I was just saying to you that that's an example of a film that we made, three million dollar budget, and it had a really good cast, up and coming people. We uh, uh, Jonathan Tucker and Catherine Heigl and Larissa Olenek, Jess, uh, um, um, Jamie Presley. So we had a really good cast, and it was three million dollars, and and the film is, is still to this day is really high ranked in IMDb. IMDb. But it was it's an example of something that uh, is just almost impossible now to make in the same way we made it. Uh, you know, so I'm sure we'll get to that. But the reality was that was my very first film, and I realized how how fortunate I was to do that. But we made like five films in, in two and a half years. We did a TV movie as well, and um, based on a best best selling book, and uh, and it was and boom, I had a producing career, and it was it was fantastic because the the thing that um, I think that most people uh, the highlight of their career 
will will be if they are fortunate enough to make movies is to be on a set and to be working with the different you know department heads and and to be working with actors and to be work and then to to go to a screening audience uh, seeing mm-hmm. your movie and rating it and and doing that whole process you know, it is not only the highlight of everything that I've done, just going through it and being on a set, you know, and, and feeling like, you know, you're, you're, you're a king, you know, you control everything that's happening in the budget and you're, you're responsible for it, but it's wonderful. And uh, you do all of that and you, it's, it's almost impossible not to see where you go, oh, I got to get back into production. That's why everybody wants to be in production because it's, it's fantastic. It's a great, it's a great process and everything. And for me, it was, it was, if it was a fantastic process to finally get something made, then screen it for an audience and, and see them laugh at the, the, mm-hmm. the spots that you want them to laugh at and everything. And then I would just say as a screenwriter, it was fantastic because you're seeing actors, again, breathe life into your things, seeing lines that you thought would work not not work lines that mm. that you thought oh if I did this I do that or do this or or the way it's edited now adds punch to it all of that made me a better writer uh, being a producer as well. I'm curious you just mentioned um, that you thought this was impossible to do the, in you know the current times these three and four million dollar films why is it impossible now do you think? I think it's really, really hard. Um, so the really quick version of how basically it used to be done was you would you would sit there and you would find really great material. You would sit there and you would put out the pay or play offers for the actors. You would get a, obviously a great director that, that was good for the material. And then you would sit there and a lot of times you would uh, take that package and you would sit there and you would pre-sell foreign territories. And then you would also then uh, kind of like uh, get some interest, maybe from on a domestic side, maybe just for the DVD rights, okay? And then you would take all of that to a bank. You know, Comerica at the time was a, a bank that was doing these kind of things. And then you would take all these commitments in the foreign market, maybe the DVD thing, and then they would sit there and give you the money. And they would like sit there and they would give you like, you know, 80% of what was promised. And then there was a, what they so-called gap. And then you would bring in some, maybe, a, maybe it was pros, pro investors but sometimes it was what we always referred to as the 20 dentists from anaheim who were mm-hmm. like private investors wanted to be in the movie business blah 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 and they would fill that gap of like so you had your budget and you would go make your movie and that's how we made the movie more or less and that's how we made a, a lot of movies and and what has now the where we are is like whatever it's like um, in the Charles Dickens line, the best of times, the worst of times. No, it's just the worst of times right now, because basically what you have is uh, since the pandemic, but even before then, even before then you have the DVD market got gutted. And that was like, that the studios were surviving. They were break even with marketing a, a movie for the theatrical marketplace. They were breaking even at best usually. And then they would make their money off of the DVD market and the cable sales and all that kind of stuff. So when you lost the DVD market, which we have lost, the DVD market around the 2008, 2009 recession area, that was the DVD market got gutted. And so there was a huge money source for everybody that just just went away. Then basically, um, while this was all happening in the foreign markets, the theatrical releases were getting really uh, were were being supported for the most part by foreign money. At first, it was 60 40 domestic. Uh, you, you would make your money back 40 percent foreign. Then it started to switch over the years. And then pretty soon, I would say by 2010, it was definitely 60 40. The studios were making their money in the foreign markets and everything like that. So if the studios were doing it and you were trying to do something at the three, four million dollar mark or two million dollar mark even, you would sit there and you would you would be doing this whole foreign market thing. Well, that has fallen apart as well uh, more recently because of the pandemic. But at the same time, it has fallen apart. Now, why? Why did it fall apart? Well, there's, there's several reasons. Some of them really good for movies and audiences who enjoy things. Part of it was that the um, that every country in the last 10 years has gotten so much better with uh, with their home uh, native 
filmmaking. So they were making product that they're, the people of the population wanted to see before they wanted to necessarily mm. see an independent film or even a studio film from America. So as that was rising, then there, so there was less call, less demand for those kind of mm. things, and they were rising. And that's a good thing, you know? That's, yeah. So that, that's how so now we've, we're seeing some movie from, you know, New Zealand, or we're seeing some, uh, then there was the ne Netherlands. All of a sudden, you know, you would, the, Finland and, and, and Scotland and all these films were, they were, they were, they were having viable marketplaces. So that was happening. And, and so that was hurting the, 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 the budgetary, you know, trying to get some money for your movies. Then, then television, uh, got really, really huge creatively, um, to the point where, um, there was less of a market in the foreign market for independent films and for even studio films, because now it had kind of gone geared toward more and more like for television stuff, you know, t TV mm. series. And then Netflix and Amazon and the whole streaming thing happened. And then everything really did just change overnight. And so now, where do you go? And that, that was, that's the big problem. Um, I have said to you that I don't, I don't really know what I would do if I had come across a project like, you know, tomorrow and said, oh, they're going to make this for three million dollars. I mean, I get people coming to me and I'm glad here's this project. We need this kind of money. But I cannot jump in there with some of the investors who who want to you know, Richard, you have something we'd love. I cannot make figures work. I can't sit there and say to them, if we make this for X, Y, Z amount of money, it's going to go out there and it's going to do this, this, and this. This is probably where it's going to end up. How are we going to get our money back? I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't have that. I don't. I can't feel confident about that anymore. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about now three, two million dollar movies. I'm talking about even at, 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 at you know, under a million dollars. I say to you that if if you don't have certain things happening, even at the one million or five hundred thousand dollar level, if you don't have certain things happening. I, I feel, you know, it, it's tough to look at an investor in the face and say, and, and, and I won't do it and say, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm confident we're going to get our money back. I, I won't do that. And you say certain things, you may say certain things in place. What are those certain things? You're talking about like an MG with a distributor. I think that, I think a distributor is kind of, I think a distributor is kind of important. I think that, um, what, I think that that's, Listen, I would say the only safest bet right now is to say to somebody, we're good because Netflix and Amazon is doing the entire budget of the movie. Okay, now, once you don't, you don't have that, I think that the, some of the creative elements are really become so important. Director, so there, there, are, there are people that will absolutely, in the foreign markets, they'll sit there and they'll say, hey, we love that director, and they'll give you money, and, and, or, or they'll give you money even after the film is done because they know that it's going to be a certain thing. So director, but then actors, so certain actors, and, and then the subject matter, okay? And sometimes the subject matter can be very niche, and, and, it, and you will get people interested in a way that if it's more just straight ahead genre kind of film, you're it's not going to make any difference, you know, because those kind of films are getting made all the time and losing money. And and then even the actor thing. I mean, nowadays, it's like, you know, I was saying to you, you almost have to have like an Ethan Hawke for a one million dollar film. I mean, nowadays, that's that's where we're at. I mean, you used to be able to go like, let's just say Ethan Hawke, you know, 10 years ago or like let's say seven years ago and have a five million dollar ten million dollar maybe with other elements and you would get finance you would get the, the financing from all these different things nowadays and it's nothing about ethan hawk i'm just saying yeah, that's yeah. the demand and that's the competition on the marketplace to get your money back is that it's it's just so in other words your other actors that are lower than the ethan hawk in in the scale of things you know nobody's lower in, but but in the scale of yeah, yeah. Fantasy things the value yeah, the sales value. value it's like I, I mean you're almost you're almost like better off just saying hey look if you're just casting that person to just have that person Let's not do that. Let's get the right person or let's get somebody that's really hot and maybe they're going to be huge in six months or a year or two years. That's a better way to go almost because the same actors in the same kind of genre stuff, they, they just they don't mean as much. And um, 
and, and you know they used to they used to be able to bank on it. You know they used to have if you have that actor, they have to be in this percentage of the film. That was how some they were trying to work around. But not anymore. Now it's just like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't care if he's in every frame of the film or she's in every frame of the film. You know, it's like. But again, this, these are like this is this is what is the, the the huge problem with right now. But you know, there's there's good things. I mean, there the mm -hmm. the good things that are is that I, I think a lot of movies that would not get made uh, are are getting made because Amazon and Netflix are, are making them and other places like that and Hulu, and and I think that's great. But if you're an independent uh, filmmaker, I think it's really tough now to make to make those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's talk about um, the cottage industry that has sprung up around screenwriter and helping get screenwriters. And I'm definitely a part of this. Um, you're one of my industry judges for the screenplay contest that I'm running right now. And so let's talk about that a little bit. You know, the first question is, you know, why did you want to be an industry judge or not even want, why did you agree to be an industry judge? Um, I'm always a little bit curious about that. Um, Cause when I was formulate, well, when I was formulating the contest, I knew I could reach out to people, but I was wondering would anybody actually respond to my meals and want to actually do this. So what is your interest in being an industry judge, I guess, to start? You know, I, I have to say that part of it was definitely um, I, I uh, wanted to see uh, what the writing was like, you know, what was happening with the writing. You know, um, I when I first started, uh, first of all, I would just say undercut everything I'm about to say is to say that if I had to show people the scripts that I had sold and were in development and all this kind of stuff, my writing when I first started out, I would be, oh, please, I'm so embarrassed. It was like horrible. That's how far I think everything has moved, you know, creatively. Everything is just keeps on getting better and better. It's like, you know, Mark Spitz would not be able to qualify for the swimming mm -hmm. team today, you know, and my scripts would not be anything good compared to this, the writing that is, you know, available and, and you see on television or in the movies. So, so it's not that it, what it is though, is for me to just sit there and try to like say, Hey, so what's going on? What is, what is the writing and everything? I, I do feel that it, it is, um, it's, 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 it's hard for me to sit there and uh, see somebody going through a uh, process of like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, and if this happens, then everything, and, and sitting there saying they're writing, because my experience has always been kind of like, as a producer, you would just, you would come across these scripts, or you'd come across this writer, and they just, they had it, you know, there was maybe problems or something like that. You would work with them and all this, but they were just like, they, you, they were solid and they were solid from like, almost like day one, you know, you were working with them and they were young, you know, I mean, the guy, the guy that I, one of the guys I'll never forget, he's, uh, he's a big showrunner right now, but the first time we ran into his first script that we were, I mean, we wanted it and we didn't get it and he, he ended up making it as a movie. He was great. And you just knew there was, there's something there. So the thing about it is I'm always curious to see exactly uh, what kind of uh, talent is out there and what, as a cottage industry or as a producer as, or as a screenwriter, what can you do to help that? How, how can you bring that up or how can you get that you know, to a level where they're, they're, they have a career or they're doing this? So that's probably why I, I definitely wanted to get into the thing. But also what you were talking about, too, was um, and this, I, I think it's something you should be really proud of is, is that um, before I got involved or uh, around that time, I sat there and I said, look, I'll be honest with you. I, I just I'm not really uh, my big deal is what I see is a lot of people taking advantage of people that want to be writers and people that want to be screenwriters. And, um, and and there's just so much where, you know, people are making a lot of money doing this. It's like this is the rather than making movies and the filmmaking, they're making they're doing this and they're making a lot of money and they're off on the back because are these people really ever going to have a career or are they ever going to get this movie made? And I, I was I was skeptical, but I was seeing a lot of people being taken advantage of. And so I was mm -hmm. sitting there saying. You know, I was holding your feet to fire. I was saying, hey, so what What are you doing? Why is this going to make a difference than anything else? And frankly, when you went through it all and we had a long conversation and we did this and we did that and you showed me this and you showed me that, I was just like, I was blown away. And I was like sitting there going, uh, this is great. This is fantastic. And this is what everything should be about. And then I 
was really proud to be part of it. And I would also throw in that uh, what I was uh, really, really pr uh, proud about was that 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 the that the uh, that you were doing it for all the the right reasons, knowing that ultimately the industry has changed so much the way we've been talking about that for a lot of people, this is the only avenue that if you get noticed in a, in a contest, then suddenly you have access to somebody that you would not necessarily have access. It's just everything's changed since I broke in that you would not. This is possibly the only avenue a lot of people have. So now I'm just saying that's what's so great about if you do have a really good contest like yours, if you do come across it, then it's fantastic because it might be the only way somebody can break in and everything. And then yeah, obviously yeah. you had really good success the first year that I was a judge. You, the, the, the person that won that thing got a movie made. That's, mm -hmm. I can't even, I, I can't even fathom that. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a, that's a yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And you know, to, to your point about, you know, doing all the pre-sales and stuff, the company that he ended up getting the script to and producing it is a company, Mar Vista Entertainment. And they're very much in that flow where they have a pipeline set up, whether it be Hallmark or, or those kind of things is they're kind of like a mini studio, just pumping these things out. Right. Um, so it's pretty safe. I think they know how to make these movies on the budget, whatever they're spending probably are well less than a million dollars, but they right. kind of have their, their game plan figured out. Sure. Um, yeah. Definitely. And also because a lot of those places like Hallmark and everything, their their stuff will also run with commercials. So there's mm -hmm. another avenue coming in and all this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, they the the Hallmark thing is absolutely a, a, an example of a, a really great. Uh, they're they're making a ton of money over there because they they have a formula and they know what they're mm -hmm. doing and they have their, their budgets and and they they the audiences know what to expect and everything. So as I said, there there's a lot of good things that are happening. It's just for, for, for beginning filmmakers, it's, it's tough. Yeah. And so let's talk about, you said, you mentioned to me, you were doing a seminar, um, I guess at the end of the month. Um, and maybe we can talk about that real quick and just tell us what it's about and, um, how people can learn more about it. Kadab, it's a Utah good Kadab Film Festival, and uh, I'm doing a workshop. I don't even do workshops, but I, I wanted to do this one because the, the 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 people, the couple that are behind this film festival, are really cool. And um, and basically, uh, what I, I I proposed to them, I said, hey, so let me like you know do like five things that you should be doing in your you know in your screenplay writing and you know to uh, to elevate it. And and I guess that, that basically, uh, as a producer, I I, I definitely uh, see uh, things that that uh, I will turn me off. But I'm not approaching it from that direction. I'm really kind of approaching it more from the direction of as as a screenwriter right now. I'm sitting there saying to myself, "Look, things are changing, and um, and 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 as a writer, you 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 if if you've been doing this for a few years, or if you've been doing this for 20 years." There, there are things that you you got to do to kind of change, and I, you know, so I discussed those five things, but I, I wanted to kind of mention maybe a couple of things for anybody yeah, that's yeah. Uh, listening and everything. Yeah. So first of all, on a just general note, I would definitely say the biggest note is that uh, television right now I think is creatively the place to be, um, and I and I think that uh, also the 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 odds are better that I would totally recommend anybody that is writing right now or anybody that's about to get start writing or anything really geared toward television. Because frankly, uh, the whole creative process about television is that y you have several hours to tell a story now. And that story is going to inevitably, if it's done right, if everything is, if it's done right, is going to be deeper. And you're going to be able to get a hold of an audience in a way that, you know, makes it like people are doing fistfights about Game mm -hmm. of Thrones climax, you know, as opposed to if you did Game of Thrones in a two hour movie and you just you're just not going to have that kind of emotional and storytelling impact. And the key to storytelling for me also has always been like, you know, the twists and turns, the, the underlying things that are happening that you can that take time to build on. And as a screenwriter, working in a 90 minute to 120 format, it's difficult. You know, the three act format is much better if you're doing that on a single episode and then then you're building on another episode. And I think that the only thing that would even come close uh, to matching the creativity that has been in television for the last 10 years 
is uh, would be the Marvel movies uh, where they are doing the two two hour movie, but they're then they're but they're building on the two hour movie that was before that and the two hour movie mm-hmm. that is going to come after that and the one after that and one after that so that the audience like a television series sits down in their seats and there's already this backstory that they know about so that the things that they play out work on a deeper level than if Mm -hmm. you're just learning about all these characters for the very very first time in a two-hour format so that's my quick note is to say I would start to work on what works in a television script, you know, do the pilot, do the whole, write like a television series. And the odds are you're going to get more, you're going to get work if you're good um, because, you know, they have to fill out on a TV series, they have to fill out a a staff of writers. So they need Mm -hmm. more writers uh, per se than they would on on the feature side. So that's the thing. Um, The couple things that I would say uh, would be that uh, the things that I think that like writers could really use and I try for everything I do is to try to integrate uh, what I call undertow and also the uh, undertow meaning that you want to build something so that just your regular scenes have all of this stuff happening underneath the surface. And what I see a lot of writers not doing is that. In other words, they don't, they don't sit there and work out the certain machinations of the, of the plot and the characters and who knows, because it's just so much more powerful if, if one character knows something but the other character doesn't know that that character knows that and then go. And then the scene is taking place and there's this, these dynamics that are happening because usually the, the, you got to go for that. And, and that's why you, the good writers, when you really enjoy a TV series or something like that, I was just watching the, the, the mayor, mayor thing with, uh, uh, that was on HBO and they spent an hour just introducing all these characters and you're, you're going to tolerate it and because it was fine and it was good, but you're tolerating it because you know that they're setting up all these dynamics that are going to be paid off later. And so that's mm-hmm. the thing, you know, it's not just about just telling the story. It's about telling all of these, these things and having all these threads. The other thing I would say too, is try to have something that is that you just, the audience needs to know the answer to, by, at the end of the film, they just need to know the answer to it. And it may be part of the A plot. It may be part of the B plot. But it's something that really pulls the audience through. And it adds a lot of energy to the, like, you know, I mean, I have seen so many people will sit there and they'll go, I, I mean, the film was all right. I had to know the answer to that thing. So I would just say that a lot of times when you can add that to your story, it really makes a huge difference. And it can be something as, as minor as, you know, what happened during this thing? How did you get that name, you know? So, so you see that a lot of times, you know? And, and, it, and it, so you want something bigger, but if that's all you have, mm-hmm. I swear to God, you should do it, okay? And then it can be something much bigger, like what happened years ago that put this character on this path to finally doing all these things and you only reveal it at the end because that's where it should go, but it really, people want to know. And that adds an energy that I think that, uh, that I don't see enough. I think that, that, that when I see something mm-hmm. that I really love, I, I see that kind of energy. The mm-hmm. last thing I would mention to you that I think is uh, the, the real game changer in the last uh, 15, 20 years. And if you're not doing this, you got to start doing it because it's the thing that when I see it being done as well, um, and it's always pretty much done well nowadays, is it's it's where you know you get, you're in the hands of pros, where you're in the hands of really good storytellers. And that's the nonlinear storytelling where you are no longer uh, faced with the burden of, of telling a, a three-act story and staying with, oh, you know, the first act, setting up the story, setting up the characters, doing some exposition, doing this kind of stuff, you know, you are rejiggering everything. And you're, and, and television series now are profoundly more creative simply because they utilize nonlinear storytelling in, 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 with, with, with so much, uh, mm-hmm. sometimes on every episode, that it is like one of these things where it gets you a lot. A lot of times you're you're stuck with oh I've got to set up this story and 
And so, um, you know, not a lot happens as I'm setting up the story. So first of all, I would question whether you should be doing that story. You know, that, yeah. But then second of all, though, if you did a nonlinear storytelling, you can immediately start off with a bang and, and start all this stuff, something that's happened two days later or something that, mm -hmm. that's happened, you know, three months later. And then you're working your storyline toward that and you maybe you keep kind of coming back to it. So it solves that problem where you don't have that. What do I do with this thing? I want to grab the audience at the very beginning. And, you know, mm -hmm. and then a lot of times people, the pros will, they'll sit there and they'll grab that and they'll say that. And then they'll do an extra level where they'll say, oh, and you know that thing that we started with now that we're, we're here, Guess what? You're not seeing it the way you saw it the first time, right? Now you see it in a totally different way. And then they're doing the nonlinear storytelling where it used to be traditionally called flashbacks, you know, where somebody would go, oh, I remember when, mm -hmm. but not anymore. Now it's just very slickly done where all of a sudden it'll be the beginning of an episode where you're going to be kind of telling this story, but you're going to be focusing on maybe on one character. And then, so now you're going to dovetail back and forth between what's happening in the present and what happened in the past. So now for like maybe the show has been on for like several episodes. But you don't know, really know about, you just heard about their backstory, but you don't know anything mm -hmm. about it. But guess what? You know that the, the good guys, they're going to come back to it and they're going to devote an episode. And then suddenly you're going to see what everybody's been talking about and you're going to see how it all plays out and how it dovetails into the present. So nonlinear storytelling is the bomb. And it is the mm -hmm. thing that is the huge game changer as far as I'm concerned for uh, modern storytelling. And, and it, is, uh, it, it is not something that could have arrived any earlier because audiences, you only do stuff like this uh, when audiences are ready for it. And now the, we have the most sophisticated audiences watching media, you know. Yeah, yeah. What's a good example you could point to from a recent TV show that uses this nonlinear storytelling effectively? Yeah, the, the well, um, I'm trying to think of um, uh, one of the, the, I would say that to a certain extent, the, uh, the what's the uh, Marvel thing that just came on was um, oh, Winter so Soldier. Sorry. Huh? Yeah, but the one before that, Wanda. Yeah, yeah, Wanda Vision. Okay, so Wanda Vision does you know some of this nonlinear storytelling, um, but and I'm trying to think now like uh, of thing I, I would just this, is, this is so totally dates me, but I really be, I really believe that it 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 started up with J.J. Uh, Abrams when he was like kind of like doing um, Alias. And programs like that, because what they would do was they would sit there and they would start with the action. And then a lot of times they would sit there and then all of a sudden they they would they, they would get you there in the halfway part of the show. Then suddenly you were there at that one thing, you know, mm -hmm. and then we're not we're not coincidentally when he had a chance to do one of the Mission Impossible movies. They actually started with the whole sequence with the uh, with the villain. And the another reason to do it is sometimes the villain and the hero don't meet for a while but mm -hmm. when you do non-linear you can have them meet in the very first scene you know that kind of thing so he did it in his mission impossible movie and so you're you're uh you're, you got me as far as like i'm just trying to think you know because my i think right now the most recent show that i love you know gamora they they do it to a certain extent you know they they'll they'll sit there and they will do the non-linear storytelling but there are i'm just like totally blanking but there are television series that uh, I'm not even sure they even know how to tell a very straight ahead linear story. It would be, it would strike them as so wrong DNA wise that they wouldn't even do it. But it, it really takes a sophisticated audience to sit there and do it. And as a filmmaker, you have to be really sophisticated about it too. Sometimes it'll be, um, it'll be it, it, your, the story that you're telling is so complicated that there is, a whole thing built in now that, like, you know, you have to identify a uh, certain what they look mm -hmm. like when you're in the past so you don't confuse the audience or, or continuity wise or are we in the past or are we in the present and everything, you know. And, and so, you know, th those are the kind of things that, that, you know, totally you have to get down perfect mm -hmm. or or you confuse the audience and they they like they don't know but i don't i don't really see that happening because everybody's kind of got their 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 mm -hmm. they they know exactly what they're doing when they're doing it but i just kind of highlighted some of the things that it gets you but what it bo boils down to is this that certain scenes at certain points in the storyline if it was done in a chronological way you wouldn't get the emotional payback that you do when you 
mess with the chronology so that that scene is put further back and you bring up certain things that have happened with the characters, character, characters, all these things that have happened in the past leading up to that moment, stuff that might have happened 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 days ago, 10 hours ago, and that by the time chronologically in the telling of your story, you get to that scene, it's so much deeper in a way that you just cannot do, you know, um, in, in, you know, the, it, it's the solution to like why people love novels is that they'll read 300, 400 pages. And when they get to a certain something, it has a payoff because they've endured three, 400 mm -hmm. pages of that character's thing. Whereas in a, in a television show or in a movie, especially in a movie, frankly, in a movie, you, you, if you told this very chronological story and how are you going to really have that emotional payoff that would be similar? And the only way is to sit there and show what has led up to this relationship, you know, if whether it's mm -hmm. how, how long it's taken that person to find that other person over years and years and years and everything that they struck. If you're going to try to tell that story in a two hour movie, nonlinear storytelling is a must. And, and mm -hmm. I think that that's just like the, one of the biggest reasons is is the emotional payoff that you you get. So anyway, I would just basically say it's it's tough. It's a, it's a very tough thing to do. But you know, I'm I'm struggling to try to tell a certain story a certain way that way, and it's tough. But if you can if you can get it, it, it the payoff mm -hmm. is really wonderful. Yeah. Yes. For sure. Excellent advice. So what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing or contact you? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything that you use or comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I have a blog. I have been able, to, I have not been able to write on it for a while because I've been so busy, but I am going to take it back up. But, uh, and that that's a uh, pit and pen. It's so P I T A N D uh, P E N dot com pit and pen. And, um, and that, uh, and so I, but whether I'm writing on it or not, but, but I'm going to, but, but there's a whole gotcha, mess gotcha. of stuff about all the different projects that I have. Oh, okay. And frankly, you know, different things that I've experienced as a screenwriter. That's what I would, mm -hmm. I guess why, you know, I, I've like been in a room where, so I have a director and I'll say, Hey, you know, and they're like, Hey, look, I'm going to get this project. We're going to do this, but we got to lick this. And I didn't do it. And it was a huge director. And I think about that all every, you know, all the time. You know, oh, I wasn't mm -hmm. able to be in this room with this guy. And, and I'm really smart. Why couldn't I figure it out with him? And, and we couldn't. And he passed on the project. And I mean, so that's the kind of story that is on there that, that even if mm -hmm. I'm not keeping up, there's, there's, there's my experiences are there. And you can, I think, learn something from him. Um, I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll round that up and I'll put it in the show notes. Well, Richard, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today. This has been fantastic. Um, lots of great information. I know people will get a lot out of this. I appreciate this. I really appreciate the opportunity and I, I'm glad. And, and I would basically say I, I really was honored to come on the show because I think what you're doing is really fantastic and everything. So thank you for having me. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, market ability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it.
We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer Dell Weston. Dell is the founder of Action on Film, which is a film festival that I actually took my film The Pinch to a few years ago, and I'll be taking my latest film, The Ride Share killer to it this year as well. It is in late July, so if you're in Las Vegas, definitely try and attend. Dell really knows how to throw a good event. It's a lot of fun, and there's a lot of filmmakers from all over the world, certainly all over this country. You really can see a lot of different types of films and interact with a lot of different types of filmmakers at this film festival. But he's also a screenwriter with a number of produced credits, so we're going to talk next week about how he was able to get those projects produced. So keep an eye out for that episode. That's the show. Thank you for listening.